My current understanding of the physics is that the kinds of things that would have to be present at the ranch to generate those effects would also have uh, catastrophic effects on, on the ranch, if not the entire earth. Whatever we're dealing with has the ability to mask its identity, to engage using stealth, and again, manipulate the environment in really disturbing ways. I've had experiences myself where I know I was in, interacting with something that I would classify more as some kind of technological <laughs> construct or, or something of that nature. But then I've also had experiences on the other side where I definitely think it was more you're crossing lines of something spiritual. With us today is the owner of Skinwalker Ranch and the majority of his team. Thank you guys for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. It's good to be so, with you, Christina. Thank you so much. And thank you for your support and efforts to, to address these topics. There are very few people that are willing to address frontier topics head on like you have demonstrated over the course of the last few years. And we, we've we considered you an, ex, an extended member of the team, if you will, uh, as you've, you've helped us disseminate kind of a lot of the discoveries and uh, material that we've been amassing over the course of our investigation that started back in 2016. Thank you. That is really nice. Um, well, to, to build on that, since our first Skinwalker Ranch interview roundtable back in April of 2023, a lot has happened on the ranch since. And Eric, I'm going to start off with you because last year it was mentioned by Dr. Travis Taylor that time is at the center of this mystery. And since our initial conversation, have you found any new information, data or evidence that promotes that theory? Ah, this flirts with spoilers. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the rest of the guys know exactly what events I'm thinking of. Well, you know, I think everybody here knows that I tend towards a more austere interpretation of things, uh, you know, and work my way towards the more interesting or exotic ones. Um, certainly, we continue to see things happening that affect um, the instrumented reportage of time, the passage of time. We see things happening with uh, often with time stamps. We see things uh, discontinuities in the data. We see changes in the apparent rate at which uh, transfer is taking place, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, something as common as playing music. You know, we've had devices, I, I don't know how specifically I can get into this, but we've had devices that are, you know, playing something whose timing we might pick up on with our ears and having it go all over the map. Uh, these kinds of things have been, uh, you know, those familiar with the program, especially insiders, will uh, recognize that we've had a lot of these issues, especially in the Homestead 2 area. You know, we see a lot of that going on uh, with assets specifically inside of that that uh, that structure, the main house. Uh, but we've also seen these things play out at the triangle, where we have devices that. Um, see, I don't want again. I don't want. I don't want to put any spoiler material out there. But we've had devices um, get out of sync. By how much time? Ah, you'll have to wait to see that. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's evasive, but 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 yes, we see. And again, uh, going back to my sort of um, disclaimer at the beginning of this, what we are seeing would have to be generally categorized as interferences with devices that measure time. And as you know, hand in hand with that, there are devices, you know, famously the GPS and GNSS devices that keep up with location. And we've seen some abrupt, significant displacements in the reported positions of those sensors. And, you know, time is, is a big part of that. So Travis is spot on when he's talking about time. Uh, that is definitely uh, on the short list of suspects. Uh, interesting topics. Short list of suspects. Can you go into more detail on that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, if you know, you mentioned uh, spatial or space time effects, um, my current understanding of the physics is that the kinds of things that would have to be present at the ranch to generate those effects would also have uh, catastrophic effects on, on the ranch, if not the entire earth. So there's something going on. There's something going on uh, that is uh, interfering with our ability to consistently measure time and and so when I speak of suspects, I'm talking about the things that might be responsible for those interferences, you know, and the full range of things, you know, it could be anything from technological. Look, there is jamming technology out there. We don't know if there are bad actors involved or there could, in fact, be some of the more interesting and even exotic physics that you hear us refer to. 
you know, we try to treat all of those subjects. I don't know if they get equal airtime, you know, through all the venues, but we really try to keep all of those simultaneously in mind. Thank you for explaining that. And Mr. Brandon Fugel, how is the research conducted at Skinwalker Ranch contributed to our understanding of the relationship between consciousness and physical reality, in your opinion? Well, <clears throat> it's a good question because I do believe these topics in the, the frontier science realm that we are delving into out here at the ranch demonstrates that there is a, a mechanism afoot that uh, involves consciousness. In fact, whatever we are interacting with, whatever entities, forces we are interacting with at Skinwalker Ranch, seem to be able to size up the individuals that enter the property. Uh, we've heard many refer to it as the hitchhiker effect, where you know certain phenomena will follow people home uh, after they leave the ranch. Uh, but even on the property, people have uh, participants, even those uh, members of our team that have gone public uh, with some of these episodes will attest to the fact that that the environment appears to react to intent and volition. Those who have brought an adversarial attitude to the ranch or, or motive uh, seem to encounter uh, negative effects and phenomena and you when you you discuss the topic of space time and the fact that we're dealing with with entities or some type of intelligence that has the ability to manipulate closed computer systems very sophisticated technology platforms as well as i believe sometimes the perception of those involved it uh, it speaks to something much more complex at work um, so I, 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 I will also say, and I'll let Eric Bard chime in as principal investigator, one of the topics that, uh, Eric has, has, uh, tackled involves remote viewing. And I think you're going to see the release of some material, some information and data, uh, relative to remote viewing efforts, uh, relative to uh, the ranch and really some of the the external topics. You when know, it think, comes to go oh, go ahead, Eric, please. You know, I I, I think we have um, above the noise. You know, I think we have the statistics to support that there is something going on, as Brandon has pointed out. Um, that is at least noteworthy when it comes to uh, what we're thinking about, uh, where are the focus of our uh, attention is, what we might be um, even sort of excited about or apprehensive about, and the events that then play out. You know, it's it, you know, there's the subjective side and there's the objective side. Um, everyone you're speaking with today has had the experience. Even Brandon, you'll you'll recognize this from just last night. Everyone on our team has had the experience also of of having exactly the same impression or the exact same phrase, however quirky the word, you know, the expression may be, you know, we'll think the exact same thing. And, you know, an example from just early this morning or last night, you know, uh, I believe I sent a message to Brandon, I believe it was about a little after 6 p.m. Um, I was in the middle of uh, writing a response to a good question from a few of our in insiders. Um, also, uh, working on a, a technical project, I, I interrupted that abruptly for no particular reason and, uh, started to, uh, compose another message to Brandon at that moment, of course, you sent me, uh, your question or your overture and yeah, it might've been close to four in the morning. And so, you know, I immediately asked Brandon, well, when did you decide that you were going to send that message? You know, hours have passed. And it was just this moment that it occurred to me to re-engage. And I think every one of us here can speak to that. You know, I, you know, Brian, I'm reminded of something. I don't know if you've shared about this. I'm reminded of something that you experienced uh, when you uh, went out to go find a, a, a missing rocket. 
I don't know if you're comfortable talking about that, but you know, again, I guess the point being that there's it's it's multi it's multilateral. It's not just uh, the ranch reacting, if you will, to what we're perhaps thinking, but it but it may in fact be bidirectional, uh, and it may be something that's going on between members of our team. Right, and I and I can piggyback that. I think each of us have had an experience where. Like we'll say things, Eric will be, we'll have a topic of conversation. I can only speak to myself, but I've seen all of us, I've seen all of us do that, do this is where we'll be talking and I'll use a phrase out of my butt that I, I don't know what it means, but it comes to mind and I'll say it. And Eric looks at me, he's like, why in the world did you say that? Because I literally was thinking the exact same thing, phrasing it identically like that. Why did you ask it in that way? Or why did you say it in that way? And I'll be like... I don't know. So I'm gaining, like I'm gaining this incredible knowledge and vocabulary that like literally pops out of nowhere where we're having these types of conversations. I mean, I see everybody else smiling because I think each and every one of us has had that experience where we will have the same thought at the identical time and say it. And Eric's like, what the crap? That was my thought. Why did you end up speaking it the way that it came out? And, and we've Mm -hmm. seen that happen, you know, going back to what you mentioned you know, there was this time we had had this crazy night of launching a whole bunch of big rockets. It might have been the day after we had the catastrophic failure of the great big one. And we wanted to get the instruments and the equipment back out of this rocket. And it was one of those days we'd been up all night and I could not get out of my head that I had to go look for that thing. It was like one of the rare mornings that we had off that we weren't filming. And I was just like, I fought it and fought it. And I thought, now you're not going to go find it. And literally it was like, it was driving me forward to go find this rocket. And we had looked all over everything. And literally I jumped in one of the vehicles and started driving. And just without question, I was told, like, it came to my head. Why don't you just look up right here on the hillside where I had scoured the night before And sure enough, literally, I got out and just started walking and walked right to the thing. I don't know why it wasn't that I had some inkling as to where it was going to be or anything like that. But it was almost as if I was, it it was like I got that itch where the last thing I wanted to do was go hike around on the Mesa and find a stupid rocket. That's Travis's domain. He loves to do that stuff. (laughs) Me, I didn't want to, but it was like I couldn't not and I literally walked right to it after having spent hours and hours the night before trying to find the thing. So there are definitely times where stuff comes into your brain that you don't know why it's there. And I can't help but think that there is an intelligence there that sometimes connects our cognitive. And, you know, again, as a team, we end up almost being of the same mind for whatever reason. So then in in regards to the consciousness aspect, can I ask all of your opinions if based on your experiences, research and conclusions that you are tending to lean towards the theory that you're dealing with either a non-human sentience or a group of non-human intelligences, what can you share about this aspect? And I'm going to start off with Thomas. Um, The... The quick, easy answer is I don't know. Uh, One thing I will say is I've witnessed enough, experienced enough on the ranch to say that I I feel uh, a high level of confidence that whatever it is, there is an intelligence behind it. I've seen too many um, anomalies and strange events take place that were, they appear to be very specific and targeted towards the person that they were happening. And that's the thing is we can be standing there on a ranch in a group and we can have one or two or three individuals out of a group of us that have an experience. And, uh, you know, we don't know why that is. We've been looking for, you know, do we share the same blood type? Do we have, we, we look obviously for any identifying factors that could link that together. But, but we've had a lot of various things happen where, um, just very targeted, very specific, even down to instruments, you know, flashing someone's personal bank card number that they use on like their, you know, their number that they use for everything. So it's, it's witnessing lots of those things that make me think there's got to be an intelligence behind it, watching the telescopes and, and seeing only the stars that we're interested in observing being removed off of this hard burned 
drive, um, things like that, that just, you can't, I, I come away and I say, I, I can't come to any other conclusion than there is some type of intelligence. Now, what that is, I, I don't know. Yeah. And to be honest, I don't know that, I wouldn't even guess. Yeah, Christina, what uh, Thomas Winterton is referencing is we, we brought out some dignitaries uh, in the past. One was a very prominent venture capitalist, sits on a number of boards uh, and is heavily involved with a lot of very high profile business endeavors in Utah. Uh, and he accompanied the president of Utah Valley University, UVU, which is President Astrid Tuminez. Uh, in, in addition to us finding out that President Tuminez, who speaks Russian fluently, could actually converse on the spot with Eric Bard in Russian uh, fluently, which was great to witness. Mm -hmm. We also saw this individual while hiking up to the Mesa to see the Masonic symbol that uh, many have said, you know, symbolizes as above, so below. Upon reaching that symbol, his trifield meter started just peaking, completely peaking, acting erratically, and then it locked in on a sequence of numbers that uh, he he described as being very uncanny. Uh, it was actually the the phone number of his childhood home that he uses uh, for certain passwords and has since uh, since he was young. And he, he, he was in a state of shock at why it would lock in on that numerical sequence, which by the way, is not, not really, it's, it's not a sequence that would be uh, naturally or, or conventionally shown on that tri-field meter. Uh, something was manipulating the device to display that presumably as a message to him that 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 it was aware of him aware of his most sensitive data his most sensitive information and it left him shocked i mean we still see each other and and reflect on that day that same day we had uh, other visitors who experienced everything from electromagnetic anomalies to another individual who's iPhone was completely drained and never worked properly. It was a brand new phone that they had to have replaced within days following their visit to the ranch. So interesting thing uh, to see the, the ranch interact with someone on the level of consciousness. And that's probably one of the, the more recent and bizarre uh, occurrences that we've documented. I think it does. It does sound that way. It does. And, and I know, hopefully I'm not stealing anyone else's thunder, but there's been so many different times where we've prepared and thought and discussed a, of some sort of an experiment or some sort of an activity that we're going to do. And it seems like the more that we think about it and the more that we prep for it, it almost feels like our efforts are more thwarted. Some of the off the cuff, you know, things that have just happened on a whim, where you know hey let's try this real quick has actually resulted in more results or more findings you know the example is you know the blob thing that was just an off the cub cuff let's go launch a rocket tonight and then all that sort of thing happened whereas you know when we prepare and we discuss and we talk about these things gosh so many times i mean and i know the guys can speak to this i saw eric nodding his head it seems as though whatever intelligence there is which makes me lean to answer your question i think that there is an intelligence there just because it seems like it's way too many times a coincidence when it's happened multiple 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 times to where we're actually thinking of what we want to do and then something thwarts those efforts in a way whether it's an equipment malfunction or a battery dying or something of that nature it just seems that there has to be some sort of an intelligence there. And again, whether it's something supernatural or non-sentient, you know, whatever that long word that we like to use is. Um, what is the term, what it, what, do you want to rehearse the term, Eric, that we all inherited from Colonel John Alexander, I believe, to describe the, the portal phenomenon? <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, so we have this construct that's been put into uh, print. It's a pretty interesting <laughs> string of words. It's a sentient precognitive non-human intelligence. And if we unpack that, you know, I think we all know what sentient means. Precognitive uh, implies something about uh, foreknowledge or something anticipating events before they happen, at least as we perceive them on a timeline. Non-human, I think, speaks for itself. Um, and so, you know, just for completeness, and I know we've all talked about this, and I've heard these these guys speak very eloquently to this point. Um, it isn't clear what the directionality of the effect is. You know, like what's the source, and you know, like, <laughs> um, you know what I'm thinking of. I guess we've all seen those experiments involving uh, mirrors being put up in the wild and observing uh, the responses of, of wildlife to the mirrors. Um, and some species evidently recognize that, yeah, that's that's an image of me. Uh, others may uh, challenge whatever the image is and alert to it and want to fight with it. You know, I've seen I've seen one. I've seen my dog do that. Um, you know, where it's just a reflection. And I think the question is, you know, are we kind of put in a similar situation where it isn't clear whether we're dealing with another quote unquote someone or whether in fact what we're seeing are reflections of our own cognitive process. These are some really interesting questions to search out. I don't know that I feel equipped to uh, bring resolution to those, but I sure am uh, interested in collecting the data to build the case. Those kinds of questions really do bring in an aspect of humility. And you know, you, you can really summarize that, like, you know, that kind of hat print term, I think, is being almost godlike, a, a type three kind of civilization would appear to be godlike, I think, mastery over time and physics in ways that we just can hardly guess. And so maybe that could also be a factor to this. Now, Caleb, I want to throw a question over to you because Thomas had mentioned are we all the same blood type? Me not included and in, in the group of we, but do you have an answer to that? Are you guys all the same blood type? Uh, not to my knowledge. I think we are all across the smorgasbord, really, on our blood types. Like, I, I, I want to, I know I'm an O positive, you know, and I'm all right with saying that. Um, but I know there's some A's and there's some B's and some that might be close. But from what I understand, we're all different. And while I still have you right here, in your capacity of ranch security, have you been alerted to anything unexpected intruding on the ranch, even to the point of chasing away off the property that you believe was non-human? Um, I know we've had, I don't think I've ever had the experience like we're chasing something off property, that we, we don't know what it is or anything like that. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, fellow law enforcement and other individuals in the in the area have told me about their encounters, if you will, and, and thing and experiences that they've had in, in other areas of the basin from, you know, from the mountains to areas very close to the ranch, maybe just very near off property um, with where they're encountering things, you know, again, across the board, uh, kind of coming back to like the intelligence thing. Um, I, I've had experiences myself where I know I, I was in, interacting with something that I would classify more as some kind of technological <laughs> construct or, or something of that nature. But then I've also had experiences on the other side where I definitely think it was more you're crossing the lines of something spiritual. And, and then I've also had experiences, again, where other individuals are telling me that they've experienced from craft to interacting with something like a, a shade figure or, or something is along those lines that they've described. Um, and it's all over the place out here. Uh, but for whatever reason, yes, the, the, the ranch is, it seems like the focal point or um, we've had the discussion that a lot of people have mentioned like a gateway or some kind of portal or something, you know, the word portal always comes up that maybe the ranch for whatever reason is you know this place that is the center for where these beings or whatever they are, are coming from well and, we're definitely having close encounter type of events and interactions i mean K caleb can attest to that and i didn't mean to interject but i think it'd be important you may want to rehearse caleb the event uh 
that played out where you and Dr. Taylor observed and actually confronted uh, something that appeared there near really your your little campsite at the the, the area that you were visiting uh, there just uh, to the yeah to the east of uh, of the ranch house in Homestead One. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, everybody on the team remembers this that night. Um, we were out barbecuing essentially one night after we got done filming and just kind of relaxing. And I remember at one point, you know, we started kind of hitting on some pretty serious subjects and, and really kind of bringing up some questions that we all had as a team at that point. Cause I, I, I think at that point in the investigation, we were still ourselves really questioning if there was really anything, you know, crazy going on out there. And I just remember uh, Tom and Eric were, uh, talking and I, I remember seeing them kind of at one point bring their heads close together and start whispering about something and later I found out that they had talked about like the energy or something had shifted but the for about 15 20 minutes I was actually thinking that we were being watched and I kept hearing this sound where it sounded like an electrical arcing uh, or some kind of popping sound and I just, again, felt like my, the hair on my back was standing, uh, on the back of my neck was standing up and something was coming closer or something was watching us. And I finally had to let the guys know, hey, I feel like we're being watched. I feel like something's listening to us or something. And I got up and I, and, you know, initially we thought that we were going to run into like a cougar or something. Um, some kind of wildlife on the ranch that was like stalking us or something. And so I had my pistol drawn out and I had a flashlight on it. And that's one reason why I drew it so I could see. And we, me and Travis went walking around this old trailer that's sitting there on the property. Um, and essentially we come into contact with this object that's about 20 to 30 feet away from us. Um, we determined it was about five to six feet long or maybe about five to six feet tall. And as my, and I remember as I was coming around this uh, house or this trailer that's out there, um, I swung my pistol one way and as I'm bringing it back the other way that Travis starts yelling and announcing what he's seeing. And I'm swinging my pistol back over and I remember seeing a flash of light go across it, similar to like sunlight going over water. And, um, uh, and then another a globe of light coming across the center of it. And as I saw this light coming across the surface, I could see like what looked like paneling of some kind. Uh, and the the surface of this kind of reflecting or almost appearing almost like maybe rippling effect of some kind, similar to like what you would think of in some well, you and, Do you and Dr. Taylor were in pursuit of yep. whatever this anomalous uh, yep. entity or object was. And upon you know flashing your lights and your, your firearm toward that direction, not only did it reflect back to you, but uh, but it quickly disappeared. And yep. you know, whatever we're dealing with has the ability to mask its identity to to um to engage using stealth uh, and, and again, manipulate the environment in, yep. in really disturbing ways. So, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a diversity of origins and agendas as manifest by the data and the observations that continue to be presented to the general public. Is this, is this the predator entity yeah. that you're referring to or is this a different one? No, that's what we were, that's pretty much what we compare it to because of, we think it's that cloaking effect is what we were seeing. And essentially, and this is where it's like, I don't know if it was just happened to be that same moment. But as I started thinking, is this actually a threat to me? And do I need to engage this with my own, my own force is when it either closed in on itself and disappeared or it rotated on its center. But when it did that, both Travis and I had the distinct feeling that it went north across the canal and up the Mason. So we went running after it to see if we could 
continue engaging with it somehow. And then I want to say a couple weeks after that, maybe a week, I want to say Tom and Travis had a potential interaction with it again. But to say it was the same thing, I, I don't think we could really say it was, but we had a lot of really interesting interactions like that within a short amount of time. Yeah, it, it appears, I think if you look at the data, you look at the the different types of phenomena observed in in that environment, it, it, it seems to underscore that there's a diversity of agendas and origins at play. It's not, I mean, some of it's malevolent, some of it's negative. I mean, we've had people end up injured or have negative experiences, even ending up in the hospital. And we've had others that have peaceful interactions that feel a sense of peace in that environment. Uh, trying to understand and get to the bottom of it, as well as documenting the reality of the phenomena is our, you know, is our, is our focus. As it should be. Now, Thomas, from your understanding, when it comes to deceased cattle, cattle mutilations, or even missing animals, have you noticed a pattern in it being seasonal or is it just completely random? No, I don't think, I don't, well, thank goodness we haven't had enough livestock die to really establish any pattern. Um, but with the few that have, I don't, uh, I mean, we had one in late October. We've had one in August. We've had one, I, 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 as I look over them, I don't know that we can pinpoint that and say that they were uh, a calendar, you know, there's any kind of calendar pattern to it or, or even say weather uh, necessarily, um, you know, one happened when it was cold and other one was when it's hot. So uh, not any patterns I have been able to see. Uh, maybe, maybe Eric has seen otherwise, but I haven't been able to discern anything. Well, Thomas, you know, if we take into account things that have been shared with us before our time, you know, going back at least until the 1980s, while we don't necessarily see a temporal pattern, there might be some spatial clustering, you know, some locations yeah. on, on the ranch where these things tend to happen. I see everyone's, everyone knows what I'm talking about. I could probably finish the thought. Um, you know, we've had it shared with us that in particular, this fence line, uh, you know, we have this, what I refer to as the East Field. You know, there's a fence line that runs north and south, um, you know, right up here to the command center, right by the, the uh, what we call the ranch house and towards the south. And, you know, there, there does seem to be a clustering of um, cattle deaths along that fence line. Now, you know, of course, I've, I've floated some ideas about why we might be finding them there, you know, uh, prosaic ideas, in other words. Um, but I think there's more than that going on, honestly. Um, well, when you, when you have accounts that go back many, many years, I mean, you go back decades, long before Sherman, the Sherman family or Bigelow's back to the Myers era of ownership uh, that's, that come from credible firsthand witness accounts uh, of bizarre cattle mutilation activity being documented and encountered. I mean, we've had you know, a retired you know, sheriff, you know, deputy sheriff, Chris Porritt, who's gone on record relative to his experience uh, responding to events on the ranch and inspecting these bizarre cattle mutilation events as, as well as other strange activity, even UFO activity. But you have beyond law enforcement, you have private individuals, in fact, very respected individuals in the community that have independently come forward with their own firsthand accounts where they have had witnesses with them, credible witnesses with them that uh, that go back to as well. We, we've had one recently that came to us with an incident from 1979 and, um, and a history that even goes back to the 1930s with the old homesteaders. He, uh, we had uh, the Locke family and it was a Christopher Locke who came forward with, with the, the family history and record that has been passed down of strange events that go back nearly a hundred years on the property. 
That's really interesting. And I think it's really awesome that people are coming to you willing to tell their stories. Because I know for a while, as soon as you had bought the property, up until like maybe like the first or second season, people were having difficulty coming to you and relaying their encounters. But it seems that recently it's becoming more prevalent. Now, Eric, I got to ask you this question. I think it's on a lot of people's minds. What benefits have you noticed um, after working with Omnitech, the AI company, and how has it been integrated into your research? Well, that's a great question. You know, clearly, uh, folks familiar with the work that's going on here in the off season know that there's quite a bit of uh, load balancing that needs to take place. Uh, you know, uh, Omnitech came to us, as you know, it's been more than a year ago, a couple of years ago, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, one of their strengths is uh, platform development and the aggregation of data from different sensor types and different sources um, with an eye towards uh Modern techniques, including artificial intelligence, you know, uh, machine learning is probably the better term here. Um, so currently on the ranch, to speak more concretely to your question, uh, we have a set of what I call multi-physics boxes. They may have another name. Uh, basically, these are uh, installations uh, of devices that are looking at things like uh, received RF power over a given range, you know, coming into an antenna, uh, looking at uh, magnetic perturbations, uh, changes in the direction and strength of magnetic field. Uh, also, of course, GPS deviations, um, you know, a wide range of sensors that can be put into these nodes and then brought back into a central database. Um, I, look, a, a lot of that work is still um, formative. Uh, we're not quite as far down that pathway as I think we would all like. Um, but uh, I have as recently as a couple of days ago, had some interactions where we've been talking about uh, even some new techniques involving uh, a larger number of distributed devices being brought into a central model where we can in real time visualize what's going on. So I'm really glad to have um, some additional manpower um, on this problem set. Well, and and uh, maybe just add a little bit to that, you know, uh, what Omnitech brings with with this new um, some of these new sensors and boxes that Eric's talking about, you know, we're trying to disperse those across the ranch. And so um, some of those fit in, you know, plug and play nice with what we already had. And some of them required us to kind of go back to square one and, and start over. And so integrating and, and really bringing those in has been a massive undertaking um, the amount of infrastructure that we have put into the ranch over the last 18 months has been incredible. And we're, we're reaching new places that we've never been able to reach before and adding instruments that haven't been, but, but it, you know, this is a, this is a long term uh, partnership. And, and so there's been so much, you know, some of these places we had to start by simply trying to get the power and network there first. And so, it's been quite the process to bring them on board and, and get that just because there's so much to do and, and they're, it's such a massive over uh, undertaking. So, yeah, these are guys, the, these are guys that while having, you know, all the, the sort of technical prowess aren't allergic to rolling up their sleeves and, you know, going up the Mesa with us or, you know, mm -hmm. climbing a tower or doing whatever it takes to, uh, to expand the infrastructure as, as Thomas was talking about. And so, um, you know, seasonally, uh, we, we, we see periods of greater activity on those fronts. And, you know, sometimes we just uh, um, strategize. We, you know, we plan for whatever moves will follow. Brendan, did you want to add to that? No, this is, this is, this is great. This is great. great detail. Okay. I, 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 just touching on what Thomas was referencing, I mean, a lot of people do not realize that when we took over stewardship of the property, when I acquired the property in 2016 and engaged Thomas initially uh, within days of that acquisition to, to help us assess the, the ability to actually conduct an investigation, the, the, the ranch was woefully uh, uh, 
inadequate as far as having the the infrastructure necessary to to conduct mm -hmm. this type of investigation in fact even the the septic system didn't even work. we couldn't uh, even flush the toilet yeah we couldn't flush the toilet we didn't have adequate we didn't have fiber optic mm -hmm. infrastructure to be able to put a, a wi-fi network into into place there were no operating security cameras uh or surveillance of of any sophistication it was really an old cattle guard gate with the rusted paddle you know padlock um out at the uh out at the road and and caretakers that were communicating via fax with mr bigelow um i you know the cameras that uh, eric bard ended up dismantling with thomas winterton with the help of of dragon and caleb uh were 1990s closed circuit television cameras of, of the day. And so what people are seeing unfold with respect to our investigation, it represents a quantum leap in frontier science uh, and and really a an unprecedented effort to document the reality of the phenomena at this really strange piece of property and location. But it, it, we've come a long ways. We've come. We've really, uh, I think, seen a, a an incredible seismic shift in the way that this property has been addressed and investigated. And we're excited to continue to make those improvements. And I think it's important to note too, just real quick. <clears throat> the one thing about this investigation that is so unique, you don't see anywhere else in the world. Is is if this was anywhere else. We would go, we would implement everything that Omnitech had to offer. We'd get it up and running. We'd test it. We'd measure it, adjust it. And when it was running smoothly, we would make this big announcement that we've brought them on board. And what you see so often, and, and you see this so often in the science, you know, a lot of these papers that they release are years in the making. We're announcing this stuff to the public on the front side. And so just like announcing, I'm going to go build a house, if, if I haven't even started the permitting process, there are going to be months and months of work that goes into that before you even could put a shovel in the ground and start to see any results. And so with our efforts, so much of this we've announced on the front side and bringing on a partner like Omnitech with the AI and all of that is such a massive undertaking that it takes it takes some time behind the scenes to get this up and going. And uh, it's it's kind of a unique approach that we have. and. And I know Eric and Travis have talked about this many times, you know, so many other science efforts, they have the ability to spend years refining and really diving in. And we're kind of running by the seat of our pants and sharing, sharing the discovery of the journey with the, 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 you know, those, the audience and they're seeing it as we're discovering it. And the result is, is sometimes you're getting the unrefined, very raw <laughs> initial reaction and, and then when we make big announcements like the Omnitech, we're so excited for that. But then the real work begins and we have to go to work. And, and sometimes it can be months or even years before some of that stuff is realized. I really like the comment. I really like the comments about the, uh, the scope and the scale of the development effort. You know, we we speak of the work that we're doing in conjunction with Omnitech as a uh, technology and systems incubation effort. I think uh, some of what we're putting together, certainly some of what we've been brainstorming are very original, uh, perhaps, you know, one of a kind uh, systems. And, uh, you know, it, look, I'd be lying to you if I, if I didn't tell you, or if I told you it wasn't a lot of fun um, to try these things out. Um, and so we are, we are actually just to, just to provide a little bit of a teaser, you know, we are in the process of, of uh, putting together what would be considered the second or third generation of those boxes I referred to earlier that will bring the data in from multiple points across the ranch. It's the closest approximation to the concept that you've heard me talk about before of a light garden, which is a distributed sensor array across the, across the property. And so it's very gratifying to see those, you know, that uh, technology evolution effort, you know, going, going forward. And I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on the next generation of that equipment. It is really exciting to see everything happen in the process, really feeling a part of the team. And 
a good example of this is the Insider Project, which has been running for a good amount of time now. So I got to ask, how much is it helping you with keeping track of the various phenomena going on there? And can you share any exciting new aspects of the Insider Project for those thinking of joining? Caleb, take it away. Um, well, we just launched kind of an upgrade, if you will, to the website itself, which I've really been enjoying because I think it's actually going to make it easier for us to be able to interact with all the insiders just in one place because before it was kind of spread out between a couple different platforms. Um, I think they're, what's been fun is they've actually found things on the cameras live and brought that to attention to Eric and some of us on the team. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been really neat that I think they have found some very interesting footage and brought it to our attention. And so I think there's definitely been a value add to the investigation overall. Um, well, just, gosh, uh, gosh. it's we, yeah, when, so fun. When has there ever been an effort where people can have a 24 seven live stream into an active site like this, an active scientific investigation? I mean, it's it's unique for them to do that and to be able to engage with Eric Bard and others. I mean, to have the principal investigator and chief scientist actually real time interacting with and messaging on the discord on the chat with people as they are logging observations, as they're logging everything from what they they believe to be potential unidentified aerial phenomena or UFO activity to to even strange events that happened in the homestead. One of my favorite insider um, participation stories and experiences was when, you know, last year, a group of insiders that were monitoring the surveillance cameras at Homestead 2 identified at, you know, nearly 2 a.m. in the morning in the middle of winter when it was like 10 degrees outside uh, no wind blowing or anything else occurring, uh, the door slamming shut out at Homestead 2, and that's some entity uh, appeared to have slammed the door, which had been sitting ajar for I don't know how long and rusted. Uh, but to see that kind of manipulation of our environment caught on camera and the, the kind of strange or I guess what you call paranormal activity logged by by insiders, by those who are collaborating with us on a crowdsourced basis is, it's pretty incredible. I, Christina, you're out in the public. You're, you're addressing these topics on a regular basis. Is, it, is there another effort like this where you can actually participate actively in a frontier science investigation? Not that I found. And I've been looking and there, there is nothing that compares to the work that you guys do. The insider project really making, making people feel involved in the research and it's helping you. It's thousands of eyeballs looking at things that maybe one, one or two of you might miss uh, in really obscure hours of the day as well. You can't find that anywhere else. No, you might be setting the foundation for other people to do the same in the near future. Yeah, I, the, the level of transparency that we've demonstrated and collaboration with the public, with third party experts and professionals, uh, I, I'm i shocked that 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 people are still questioning the validity of the investigation or the historic nature of it, to be really candid. I think people who ignorantly you know, pontificate online or throw stones are, are doing so ignorantly without actually doing their due diligence or engaging. Uh, we, we're quite proud of this effort and we're going to continue to improve on it and look forward to these expanded resources. This insider program that is easily accessed just through our web portal at www.skinwalker-ranch.com. Again, that is at skinwalker-ranch.com or hyphen, you know, skinwalker-ranch.com is, is an incredible resource for the public to be a part of something that is really special. So I, and I think that one of the really cool things here is um, the amount of stories and reports coming back to us. I've had multiple insiders tell me, and, and you know, I, I think it's really neat because we have just a gambit of individuals as insiders from different scientists and other things like that, just to normal everyday people who are just curious about it and want to know more. 
But what's been really fun is many of them are experiencing things in their homes thousands of miles away that we as a team have reported. And, and these people are swearing up and down that they've never had anything happen before. And, and so that poses it does pose an interesting question is like, is there something that once they're linking into the, the ranch that way, is, is that opening them up to something? I, I don't know, but that it's been an interesting topic. Yeah. But I actually have to get going. So what Kayla brought up was the hitchhiker effect. And I think that is something worth mentioning because many of you have encountered that you take something home with you. But what's more bizarre is that these people that are just watching cameras on the ranch are also experiencing very similar phenomena there. And do you at any point even now, do you have any answers on why that could possibly be where it's being transmitted through a laptop, through a computer? Through dragon, a cell phone? What, I see Dragon shaking his Dragon, what do you think? What is your perspective? I honestly, that this one is the most puzzling to me because as much time as I've spent on the property and things like that, I've never experienced any of the hitchhiker effect phenomenon, if you will. I haven't had equipment malfunctions on a personal level i haven't experienced things outside of the ranch and things like that so i'm the wrong person to speak of it um speak to it do i dispute it no i don't like because i know each and every one of these guys and vast a number of other people that i trust and believe and i've seen you know actual evidence of that sort of thing happening um, so that's, that's the strange thing to me, why some people and why not others. Um, but personally, like I said, knock on wood, I, I haven't experienced anything of that nature, but, uh, I know it's a thing. I know it's real. I mean, gosh, Dr. Taylor had a chicken decapitated on his, <laughs> by his automatic chicken it's gate not funny. clear, clear it's in not Alabama. Funny. It's that's not funny. <laughs> It was actually a pretty funny story when he told it, but, <laughs> you, but yeah, you know, so Bryant, Bryant, for, for, for claiming to be the wrong guy to address the question, I think you said some really important things and some yeah. things that are suggestive that, you know, I, I think we stand to learn as much about the observer um, as we do about the thing being observed uh, through this question. Um, look, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't have my arms fully around this. I don't think any of us do. Um, we do our very best, um, and I think we do a good job of not pre-filtering the data, not you know coming, receiving these reports with with undue bias. Um, and so, yeah, as has been mentioned, uh, you know there are individuals who both on and off the ranch have experienced some things that we associate with that you know vague term you know phenomenon or hitchhiker. Um, well, I. I'll, I'll tell you, even though I, I'm in Bryant's camp, I'm, I'm the same as Dragon. I haven't had anything uh, follow me home personally. I will say that my wife, Kristen, before she was my wife, when she, when she first visited the ranch, on her first visit when she returned home uh, to Salt Lake Valley, that very evening, a whole series of events occurred that were witnessed by her son. I mean, they were, they were, they were woke up in the middle of the night by a strobing orb like object that was right out hovering right outside the window uh, on the second level of their home. And you know, her son raced outside, the dog was barking. And by the time the sun had re raced out to the deck to open the deck to peer back on the the backyard to see what what this what this object was, it was just still. And they described it as just a not even no crickets. It was just an an eerie stillness that had settled uh, over the place. And uh, and I I find that interesting. I. I I haven't had anything like that happen to me. Now, Thomas Winterton just seems to be a magnet for this stuff, you know, and so he's he's had, I mean, you, Thomas, you, you're unique in that you have actually documented, you've recorded instances at your residence after leaving Skinwalker Ranch and going home where your car has been manipulated, your security surveillance systems at home, even your garage 
started on fire, correct? Yeah. Yeah, we've had a number of uh, <clears throat> it's it's this is a tough subject because like, you know, if you stick with science, you know, Eric's always good to remind us that causation or correlation is not causation. So um, and, and so many times it's not what happens, it's the timing of it. And I'll give you an example of something that happened last year as we were filming season five. I think it was season five. They all run kind of together. But um, we were in the middle of a digging exercise. Of course, I was on the excavator running the, the equipment when I got a when I got a panicked call from my wife. And she said, I'm, we're locked in. And my wife has a meditation studio in town. It's in a commercial building. Um, and she's got the upstairs suite. And it's, it, it, at that time, it, it was above a coffee shop. And uh, I guess it would have been season four. Um, but, uh, to get into the building, we, we share a, a storefront door. It's like one of those metal storefront doors with the glass in it that you see at almost, you know, any commercial building. And she said that they were locked in, they couldn't get out. And I said, well, is the lock? Like she's all, it's not locked. We made sure it's unlocked. And so she had knocked on the door of the coffee shop and, and the guy that owned it happened to be there and he came out. And mind you, as my wife and my sons, my sons are big boys. They're 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 stout. Um, my my oldest is even taller than I am. Um, they couldn't get this door to open, and they were locked in, and the, the door wasn't locked. There was no reason for it. So, I I uh, I told the the guys, hey, I got to go take care of an issue at home. I race home. And well, I raced into town to this meditation studio and I walk up and they're trying to push the door. They can't. And I, I reached up and grabbed the door and just, it just pulled right open. Um, as if the door was magnetized shut and, and this door is not even, I mean, it, it's not one that catches on anything. It's a free, there's nothing that like you got to jam it shut or anything. It just closes beautifully. So whatever was there that like magnetized this door and it, and it happened to it happened things were happening on the ranch and specifically as i was in that excavator digging a hole and uh and my wife and kids and the the guy from the coffee shop were locked in couldn't get out the door so those kind of events happen uh you know they're never the same event but i have i have so many events that have happened uh off site of the ranch that correlate with things that are going on on the ranch or interestingly enough, maybe with another team member, but it's, it's were, interesting. Were, were you near the Mesa at that time when that was going on? I'd have to go back and look at the footage. I don't remember exactly where we were taking it, but uh, I did, you know, I did keep a video diary of it. And, and like Brandon said, I've had my car, I've had strange things happen. My car that were documented on video, my home surveillance system. Um, we've, We've had a number of incidents have happened that required us to call uh, emergency personnel to respond. Um, serious things, and then some things that I just to this day I won't, I, I just won't talk about publicly because they're so disturbing. And and that's something that we all respect and have to respect because the things that you guys go through from the things that you have mentioned before in previous interviews with me, or if you wanted to keep it private, you the things that you have gone through are truly insane. And I'm really glad that you're able to document a lot of these things because you won't casually encounter this at a coffee shop, walking down the mall. You know, you're not going to have these kinds of instances, but when it comes to Skinwalker Ranch, the things that have been happening there for decades, it's very odd that it seems to almost pick on certain people versus others. And it seems like Thomas is being bullied by the ranch. Yeah. Well, Thomas asked, like it sometimes. Thomas asked for it a little bit. He provoked it. Well, I did. I refused to believe it was even real. So, in <laughs> some senses, that you know, I guess maybe not but acknowledging even, its existence to pissed it off. <laughs> but even with all the provoking, a hard time. It we there is sometimes there is no rhyme or reason sometimes to what is what occurs. Um, I mean, it's it's troubling. Okay. It's troubling uh, when you when you have members of the team that end up dealing with serious injuries and illness associated with the activity at the ranch. Uh, these topics and the ranch isn't it's it's not to be taken lightly. Uh, so I, 
we're 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 uh, dealing with uh, with some really really uh, sensitive topics. Yeah, and for, and for people who think in these terms, Christina, I think you know what what we're really describing are points on a scatter plot. You know, we don't really know what the driving function is. We don't know how much you know noise is superimposed. Of course, it's inevitable that every plot we. Every, everything we do is going to have a component of uncertainty or noise in it. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to infer the shape of a pretzel looking only at the salt. So it's- You have the best one-liners, Eric. I swear, you've just been racking these up the whole show. And I'm just like, I got to write these bad boys down. These are so good. <laughs> hey. Oh, I do. I have a whole phone full of Eric <laughs> Ericisms. Well, <laughs> once you edit the profanity out. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's no fun without profanity. Yeah, well, then they go from four liners down to one liners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but you know, I think I think it's very relatable. It, it, probably also including the profanity part. You know, I think a lot of people can relate to the our level of of interest. Uh, sometimes our heightened vigilance, um, amusement, confusion. You know, I, I it's a long list of of uh, very subjective. Uh, experiences and takes on them. And, you know, it's inevitable that we're going to perhaps overfit the data, which means reading things into it that may not actually be present. But I think what we're seeing happen over the years is that this scatter plot is being populated with more and more and more points, and we're able to get a sense of the real shape of the landscape. Something that's on a lot of people's minds right now, and I think have been since season one, is referring to the Mesa. And for this season, season five, are you going to reveal exactly what is buried in the Mesa? Are there any spoilers? <laughs> no. No, you're going to have to watch it as it unfolds. Um, and just know that that we uh, we want that we we want to bring the reality of this forward more than anyone. I mean, we've been desperate for this season of of really unveiling our most recent efforts and activity. I, I think it's 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 both exciting but also frustrating to be sitting on thousands of hours of cumulative research and work that transpired this past year with our investigation. So we're anxious to unveil and and present what is what is happening, what has most recently occurred. Uh, but we want to get to the bottom of what what is in the mesa more than anyone we're we're just trying to do so with uh with care we don't want to damage the very thing that we are trying to study and yeah. bring out and and it is important to note that we're dealing with a very dangerous unstable environment i mean there are boulders barely hanging across the entire top of the mesa that are the size of small vehicles with that that could easily not only crush the participants, but also destroy the equipment that we're uh, that we're utilizing. This is this is not as straightforward as people think. I mean, just bringing out a stick of dynamite and blowing it up ends up defeating the whole purpose of what we're trying to do and in, in verifying it uh, and and bringing it out. And and at the same time, we have to we have to look at it as a very sensitive biopsy almost like a medical procedure i think that that's a pretty good explanation on how to carry out the experiment and can you give any teasers or spoilers as we end this round table by chance that doesn't infringe on ndas of course just know awesome. that it is and i know we say this every year but it has been a compounding effect like it is some of the most amazing, uh, strange, scary, dangerous uh, encounters that we've ever had on the property. I can speak personally. I experienced more this year than all previous years combined, both from the the experiments that we that that we performed, some of the things that we found um, that can't be explained, as well as the injury, the element of danger that came into into play on multiple on multiple occasions so i guess much without giving details i mean you can if you watch the teaser for the season that played after the first episode it kind of gives you a little bit of an inkling but 
you have no idea. We came across some really weird shit. Yeah. Let's just say I've lost count of how many times the suffix "mageddon" can be attached to a, a word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, You're it, welcome. It, it, <laughs> we and, and it. Last. Yeah. It was it was the most harrowing, probably I think one of the most intense uh, experiences we've ever captured on camera since uh, since acquiring the ranch, and we're ready and anxious to. Uh, to pull the public into our confidence and to show them what has happened and transpired. I promise and no one will be disappointed. No one will be disappointed. And some high expectations. I'm excited. I'm excited how this is going to unfold, but I just have one final thing. And this is, this is the last thing we'll be covering. And it's for all of you. If you could send a message to young people and college students about this mystery that can broaden one's knowledge and curiosity about life and existence and the universe around us, what would you want to say as a message? We'll start off with Thomas and we'll end with Brandon. Um, it, it would just mirror my own experience on the ranch. And that is there's a lot more to this world than meets the eye. And so have an open mind and, uh, and then, you know, don't be afraid to question, really don't be afraid to question the questions. Uh, don't get stuck in that box of, of what's possible, what's not possible. Cause what we're witnessing out on the ranch, there's a lot of those things we've been told are not possible. So think big, don't, don't shut yourself up in a box as to what, the possibilities are and just understand there's there's a lot to this world we don't understand still Brian yeah I I couldn't agree more like that's the same thing just live life with your eyes open and your mind open don't give way to the traditional way of thinking or what is put out there as traditional knowledge or thinking or explanations of things just know that like, yes, we have a lot of education. We have a lot of things that are being taught, but there is so much more out there that we, that we're yet to understand. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Thomas said. Open your eyes and open your mind because there's a lot more out there than what we are led to believe or allowed to believe or what we're taught. So just step outside that box, just like Thomas said so eloquently. Eric? Yeah, I think what we've heard so far is just, look, it's obviously spot on. Um, the best I can do is possibly rephrase what's been said. Look, um, there's no uh, overestimating the value of creative engagement, even with technical problem sets. And so you're, you're talking about young people uh, within that group. We're talking about people who may be uh, in very formative stages of their careers, you know, still studying. And quite frankly, I think it's it's it gives real purpose and and attaches uh, deeper fulfillment to every technical problem that I've engaged when I've been able to do so uh, creatively, uh, when I've been able to take something that exists only in the ether of my own mind and turn it into something that is objectively real. I think that's a big part of what makes my engagement out here meaningful. And I love seeing that play out regardless of the environment. It doesn't have to be the ranch. Brandon? I appreciate everything that has been said. Uh, I think we, we continue to engage topics and questions that have been asked since the beginning of time. Are we alone in the universe? Are we part of a, a divinely constructed, intelligently designed reality? What is the nature of reality and consciousness? And what answers may come forward as a result of the investigation at Skinwalker Ranch. For whatever reason, we have a living laboratory that has been locked down since 1996, where a diversity of phenomena seem to converge, where everything from UFOs or UAP activity occurs along with everything from bizarre cattle mutilations to uh, electromagnetic anomalies, even time being manipulated. I mean, when our most sensitive advanced GPS systems, uh, regardless of what platform or third party experts we bring in to operate those malfunctions and 
and is not reliable over this property. I mean, I, it doesn't matter whether we're using instrumented rocketry, balloons, you know, advanced drones, fixed wing aircraft, or even my helicopter, we're seeing repeated evidence and hard data documenting the reality that there, there is phenomena that, uh, that we have yet to understand. And we're interacting with intelligence that's, that is uh, beyond, I think, what we can currently really conceive of or at least understand. So appreciate the effort. This is, we're like a family. What you see here, Christina, is a family. It's a, it's a ragtag team, group of individuals from a, a diversity of backgrounds and uh, experiences that have been brought together under a unified purpose to get to the truth to bring forward the truth relative to what is happening at uh, the world's most scientifically studied paranormal hotspot. So thank you for your efforts, Christina, and for engaging us today and for your support. The truth is out there. Thank you guys for being here and taking the time to speak not only to me, but to the entire world covering these really amazing and mysterious topics. As I said at the beginning, I really appreciate it. If you enjoy the strange and the mysterious UFOs, the paranormal and cryptids, this channel is for you. So make sure to subscribe as I do three videos right here every single week and hit that notification bell so you do not miss any of the bonus content I post right here.